Well, hello there. Good evening. Welcome to the latest of the Spitfire sessions. No cricket at the moment, but we're bringing Kent Cricket to you together with Spitfire and Shepherd Neem. I'm Steve Watts, should be your host in the next 45 minutes or so. Three fantastic panellists this evening. Sadly, not sitting behind a microphone at the Spitfire ground currently, sitting on the sofa at home. Just before we kick off, as always, we'd like to thank everyone on the front line, all the key workers uh, connected with the club. In fact, all key workers who are keeping the country going at the moment, keeping us all safe and well. This is the third of the Ken Cricket Forums, the Spitfire Sessions online for you tonight. A terrific panel. Let's get stuck in and introduce them to you. First of all, I am delighted to say tonight we are joined by Kent's captain. Let's give you some stats before we say hello. 218 matches for the county so far, 6,408 runs, 260 catches. Graduated from the Kent Cricket Academy in 2011. Can't believe that. Good evening, Sam Billings. That is a sharp haircut, Sam. How are you? Very well, thanks, Steve. Um, good to see everyone and hope everyone's staying well at home. And you're keeping fit and well, especially the fit bit. What's what is chat about half marathon or something? Yeah, it was um, for charity this morning. I uh, one of my friends has actually run six um, marathons in his fourteen foot patio over the last five days, which is pretty incredible. Anyway, he asked me to support him, and I said, "Well, uh, he gave the option of five ten or a half marathon." So I did a half marathon around the garden this morning, which was about a hundred laps. So. Uh, yeah, legs are pretty sore now, Steve. <laughs> That's one humongous garden. Uh, thank you, sir. We'll be joining you again shortly. Let's introduce the second panellist on the latest of the Spitfire sessions tonight. We're joined by Kent's Director of Cricket, a position he has been in since 2018. Uh, capped Kent player, of course. Something I always forget this bit, Paul, here. An Ashes winning England wicketkeeper, 1985. Good evening, Paul Downton. Thank you for joining us again. Hi Steve, good evening everybody. Thank you very much for joining us again. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to another evening of the Spitfire Sessions. Absolutely, and let's uh, welcome our third panellist this evening, completing the lineup. Delighted to have the CEO of Shepherd Neem. I was going to say sponsors, doesn't do it justice. Part of the furniture, part of the family of keg cricket. No doubt about it, Shepherd Neem and Spitfire in particular. Uh, Shepherd Neem, Ken Cricket have enjoyed a great partnership since 1998. Uh, Jonathan Neem is with us tonight, the CEO. Jonathan's father, Bobby, uh, was president of Ken back in 2003. Good evening, Jonathan Neem. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you also for the Spitfire shirt, which I fear is a little tight fitting, but uh, <laughs> it was dropped over earlier today. So clearly I need to do as much fitness as, uh, as Sam's been doing. <laughs> Jonathan, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Uh, I've kicked off the last two of these Spitfire sessions by thanking Shep and Neem, thanking Spitfire for sponsorship at the moment of these sessions. There's no cricket going on. We don't have a product very much as such, even though we're bringing these sessions to, to people's homes. Um, and I'm guessing that Shep and Neem, business has been hugely reduced yet still you're sponsoring us so firstly thank you very much and secondly what is the business like at Shepherd Name? is there anything much going on at the moment well thank you for asking Steve I mean it's uh, it's been the most extraordinary time with you know our world turned upside down in the last uh, six weeks or so um, we are we do still have a business much reduced turnovers down about 80 percent or so but the brewery is still producing. Um, we're selling uh, a good amount of beer to supermarkets, a few export customers that are beginning to open up, um, actually doing rather well in Australia at the moment, which is, uh, which is good news. Um, but of course, uh, you know, the largest part of our business is pubs and they're all shut. So it's very, very challenging. Um, we're very keen to get back open again, but recognize that, you know, public health and, uh, uh, all the safety measures that go with that will take precedence and that sadly we will be at the back of the queue um, probably similar to live venues and uh, other sporting and tourism uh, uh, venues that it's uh, difficult to see us opening in the near future. Just going to ask I'm sure a lot of companies at the moment are looking at their expenditure they're looking at their sponsorships their portfolios how important is it to a company such as yours to Shepherd Neem 
to still be involved in sponsorship at a time like this? Well, very important. I mean, I, I think that for all of the enormous sort of economic and uh, health challenges that we face, face at the moment, we've also got to recognize there's some amazingly uh, wonderful things that are coming out of this new society, community, localness, uh, a sense of belonging. You know, I'm really, uh, I think people probably feel more closely connected to each other, to their individual communities and to the things that they love um, than they ever have done in their life. And uh, I'm almost going to be bold and brave enough to say that uh, perhaps in the next few years, we may be entering a golden era of cricket because people won't be going overseas. They will be staying at home for their summer holidays. And, you know, those, those pleasures in life, like going to, going to Canterbury, the Spitfire ground, or indeed playing cricket at club level, I think is, and of course going to a pub garden, um, is what's going to be important in people's life rather than traveling uh, all over the world. So um, let, let's hope I'm right and uh, that we keep thinking of our immediate community. Jonathan, it's great to have you with us tonight on the, the uh, latest of the Spitfire sessions. How this works is you've all been sending in your questions in advance. We've got loads tonight, some really good questions. We're going to work through as many as possible. And with the Q&A tab uh, that you should be appearing on your screen, you can fire your questions in during this session. So thank you very much for sending in the questions in advance. One to kick off really, which is for both Sam and for Paul here, uh, which is uh, asking if the county is taking any particular steps to maintain team morale uh, when players are in isolation or at least uh, kept up at home. So good question that, Sam. Um, are you in touch with absolutely everybody in the squad? Yeah, in terms of um, most of the guys, well, all of the guys get on so well anyway. Um, it's actually looking after your mates and, and seeing how people are getting on. Uh, obviously, the club have followed 95% uh, of the players, which makes um, working for the club impossible for those guys so it's very much looking after the welfare and kind of your duty of care as employers uh, which the club have done really well uh, the physio and the SNC coach have both uh, unfurlowed as well which check in with the guys um, and in terms of I mean our whatsapp groups and we have a regular um, call to to just check in with the guys and see how everyone's going and um, it's, it's been really good the the Positive thing about this whole situation before we furloughed, every, well, before everyone was furloughed, was actually coming up with a plan of action as a squad that even though it's hard, where are you as an individual um, and give the responsibility to the individual players to actually come out of the back end of this, um, this pandemic, whenever it is, to be, a, to be a better cricketer by the end of it, whether that's looking at... Um, well, just looking at your game in general, but also the fitness side of things, it gives people the opportunity and responsibility to uh, to improve those things. So, um, yeah, it's been great. The guys have, have been exceptional in terms of um, keeping in contact and, and, like I said, really kind of looking forward to, well, they're all chomping at the bits, so they've been really working hard behind the scenes. And Paul, as the director of cricket, I'm sure you, you'll be having a handle on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sam's described it all very well indeed. Um, you know, one of the issues is that we came back from South Africa at the end of uh, our pre-season. Uh, we left the airport and actually no one's seen each other apart from well, Fred and, uh, uh, and Matt Mills are sharing a flat together uh, other than on Zoom calls. So it's been an extraordinary sort of situation. Uh, I've said before, I felt really sorry for people like Tim Brunveld who joined the club, just getting to know people. Uh, and suddenly sort of somewhat isolated, Jack Leaving as well. Hamid's actually uh, back with his, uh, his family in, uh, in Derby. But these sort of things are, are, are really challenging. What's been great is that, uh, as Sam says, the players are not allowed to work for the club, uh, but they can volunteer to do things. Uh, and we check in with a weekly call uh, when everybody's on a Zoom call, much like this, uh, and sort of update, I'll update people on what's happening from the ECB's point of view. And it's a chance just to ask questions and... Uh, uh, and have a banter around. And as Sam says, the, the WhatsApp groups that are going around, the various challenges that there are, 
Um, I see they're doing a 5K challenge at the moment, which is slightly beyond me. But I see Matt Mills coming in under 18 minutes for 5K. Uh, some pretty impressive times going on out there, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, making me sweat just thinking about <laughs> it. Um, good question coming here from uh, Mark. Uh, least surprising announcement of last week was the cancellation of the 100, the postponement of the 100 for this year. Now going to kick off next year, all being well, fingers crossed. Um, want to get the panel's thoughts on that competition. Sam, start with you on this one. You were set for involvement. A lot of the Kent boys were set for involvement in the 100. Obviously, massive disappointment, but least surprising announcement probably in the summer so far. Of, of course, it's the right thing. There's the right decision. And I'm sure the ECB haven't, haven't taken that lightly. Um, I mean, there's no guarantee we're going to play any cricket. And for that competition... Uh, it's only fair to to give it the best chance possible to succeed, which will be next year. From a player's point of view, being picked up in it, of course, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity as an individual player. Um, the contracts have been announced today that are null and void in terms of um, have been kind of torn up, which is understandable. Uh, how that kind of looks for next year, obviously the draft went ahead and was quite a big kind of spectacle on Sky Sports. So whether, um, whether they're kind of honoured or, or whatever, I'm, I'm not sure. So in terms of the guys who are involved in that, um, they'll be watching closely um, in, in terms of kind of an, another in, income, scri- pardon me, income stream. Um, it's, it's quite important. So it's all up in the air at the moment, but like, like we've all said, uh, the health of everyone is the most important thing at the moment. Absolutely. Paul, you wouldn't have been surprised with that announcement about the postponement of the 100, I'm sure. Um, are you still working on many different scenarios of starting cricket maybe in July to, I suppose, the worst case scenario, no cricket whatsoever? Are you, are you dealing across so many different possible outcomes here? Yeah, I mean... Uh, the first thing is that we know there's going to be no cricket before the 1st of July or the end of July. No, 1st of July. Isn't it? Um, the, the plans at the moment, starting with international cricket, are very much about focusing on biosecure environments. I mean, this is a new word that uh, we're all coming to terms with. And the challenges of this are how do you keep a ground safe? Um, you know, conversations going on with the West Indies at the moment. But when you stop and think about it, you know, you're going to charter a flight, you're going to bring in here bring them here, you're going to have to test them pretty regularly, you know, as players, test our players, uh, and then, you know, in, in the week leading up to the test match, you'll be practising, um, but all the work is going on uh, where grounds have hotels, so the Aegeus and, and uh, um, uh, Lancashire Ground and Old Trafford are the two obvious ones where you have test matches and, and just literally seal off the ground for all the players, uh, all the officials, all the media, all the catering, etc., and play a game behind closed doors, uh, which sounds simple, but when you actually start to sort of break it down, uh, it's uh, it's pretty difficult. Uh, but I know the ECB are working extremely hard with government, um, and I think we've been leading ECB of leading uh, been leading talks with, uh, with with the government on this right across uh, all the sports, so Premier League involved, rugby involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we just hope that we get to a situation where. Um, we can put on a game safely, at least for television. I think the chances of playing uh, in front of an audience are pretty slim at the moment. Um, I just can't see how that will happen. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see, you know, how social distancing, you know, h- how this whole situation evolves. Uh, but the chances are that the internationals, well, that the hope is the internationals will get, will, 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 will actually get away. Uh, and then we'll play the West Indies and we'll persuade Pakistan to come and possibly even Australia at the back end of the season. And the great thing about that is that uh, it fulfills Sky uh, and revenues for the game, which will support the whole game, uh, uh, you know, c- can be underscored. But from a domestic point of view, I mean, we've seen the possibility of a, you know, a shadow fixture list. We start with some four-day games uh, in, uh, in July uh, with a T20 at the back end of the season. But again, the same issues are there. How do we make the ground safe? And whilst the international grounds will invest very heavily on testing systems, and as I say, have a ground where there's hotels and just seal it off, it's more difficult to see how we can replicate that at county level at the moment. But it's still you know, a couple of months away. Um, there's an awful lot of people with an awful lot of brains working on this. 
uh, and it's clear that there's a demand for sport and the government would like sport to go on. We've just got to find a way of making it safe. And Jonathan, as a, as a chief executive of a company which is heavily involved in sport, has been for a long time, and indeed as a cricket fan, disappointed at the, the postponement of the 100? I, I, I find it difficult to judge the 100, having obviously never seen it. I can very much see the commercial benefit of it, and I can see that it does bring a, a different dimension to the, to the game. Um, I mean, as, as someone who plays, I'm, I'm uh, waiting to be convinced yet about the difference between T20, but I'm sure that there, there is, the, is that difference. And, uh, you know, I love, I love T20 uh, when you play it at club level and love, love watching it. Um, so I think anything that, that widens the uh, cricket audience is to be applauded and certainly worth giving it a go. I know that people on the inside, as we've heard, are convinced. So... You know, I have an open mind and it's a shame it's not going to go ahead this, this year. Thank you very much to Jack who sent in this question. This is one for you, Sam. Um, if you had to be in lockdown with one member of the current Kent squad, who would it be? <laughs> and why would you choose that person? I'm sure you were hoping I wasn't going to ask you it, but you've got to give a good answer anyway. Wow. Um, geez. I haven't even thought about this. <laughs> um, I would have to go for probably Zach Crawley because yeah. he'd, he'd throw me a lot of balls, even though I, I'd have to throw them back at him. He'd want to practice cricket. So uh, both being batsmen, I think that would be the best way. And he also plays golf. So, um, yeah, if, if we'd probably have a chipping competition or something like that. He, he loves all that. So he, he's a funny guy. Um, he, he's very good company. So, uh, and, and always great to have a debate because he will just come out with a rogue comment here or there. So, um, yeah, it's a good, good company. And that's his county captain. How proud have you been watching him on the international stage this winter? Yeah, incredibly proud. Uh, I think Joe said a couple of weeks ago that it was the, one of the best moments of his career. And um, any time especially being an academy graduate himself, any time uh, one of our Kent boys makes their international debuts, brilliant for the club. And ultimately, that adds huge amount of value to the environment we're trying to create. Um, it shows we're doing the right kind of things as a club. And if you look at actually um, the squad currently, we've got two guys also in the England Lions and Matt Milnes and Ollie Robinson as well. Uh, two guys in the under-19s, Hammy and... Uh, Jordan Cox so we've got a whole host of internationals the coaching staff as well is now looking like a real kind of international setup in, in terms of experience which can only be a good thing for those domestic players as well and we've got a lot of guys who want to push uh, for international honours as well so um, I mean going back to Zach he sets the perfect example um, that we want to try and create in terms of our players in terms of um, like I said, setting an example for the group, but also to the wider population. His work ethic is second to none. Uh, I, I'll run him close, I think. Um, but no, I think he, he's just fantastic and um, we're very proud of him and we're looking forward to seeing him and others uh, represent England uh, for years to come. Next question. Oh, I should just say before we get on to the next question, by the way, that don't forget you can continue to send in your questions during this live webinar uh, using the Q&A tab on this uh, Zoom thing here. And the best question which our panel are going to come on to and choose later will win a prize courtesy of Spitfire and Shepherd Neen. <laughs> no cricket, you're sponsoring and dishing out prizes, Jonathan. I don't want to keep blowing smoke in your direction, but it's terrific. Uh, question here for Sam, and I'm going to start with you on this one, Paul. We're not going to ask you a director of cricket question. I'm going to ask you a wicketkeeper question. Uh, this is coming from Keith. My 13-year-old son is currently a budding wicketkeeper, and he's wondering if Sam and Paul, we'll start with you, Paul, have any particular tips for him to stay sharp this summer? Great question, considering he can't actually play cricket, of course. So what did you used to do when, when the games weren't on? Well, that, that is a tough question, actually, isn't it? I mean, you know, wicketkeeping is about fitness and agility. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff you can do in terms of a physical point of view. 
But actually, when you do get the chance to play, the key thing for any wicketkeeper is expect every ball to come to them. When you're keeping wicket, the batsman's in front of you, and it looks like a really straight, you know, easy, easy ball to hit. Something happens, and suddenly it's come straight through to you. So imagining every ball is going to come through to you when you next keep wicket that is the best tip that I ever had uh, as a wicketkeeper. Sam, anything to follow up with? I need, I need that advice myself. <laughs> uh, my parents, um, I gave them plenty of headaches and um, I, I bet he, he wishes I didn't answer this now. But I used to get a tennis ball, whether it was with a bat in terms of my batting and just chuck it against the landing, small space, but quickly and just hit the ball back. Same with wicket keeping, throwing the ball as hard as you can against a wall or and an alternate one hand to another find a little piece of wall and th that was great practice for me it's a small space which that agility as as paul mentioned is so key and it just keeps you a little bit sharp um, and a tennis ball generally doesn't break too many things so i hope fingers crossed the budding wicket keeper um yeah takes that advice on it doesn't break anything no disclaimer Two England wicket keepers giving you advice there, Keith. I hope that you're listening very closely to that. A uh, question that's coming live here. Jonathan, this one's for you. 150 years we're celebrating of Kent cricket this year. and Hopefully we get some in before September. Um, is Shepherd Neem producing a special beer for the 100th and, oh, 150th anniversary? Well, now there's a challenge. Um, uh, we better get on with it. Um, <laughs> we... <laughs> um, not not immediately uh, on our on our books, but uh, if we could reopen the pubs, that's a really nice idea. Um, I think we ought to look at that. Well, all right. Well, as, as we're in this current situation, how about by next April, when hopefully there's some sort of normality returned, and we're looking forward to a new se a full new season. How about a 151st anniversary edition? <laughs> there you go. You got me on the spot now. Um, I think we better look at that one. Yeah. That is a great idea. A uh, question for Sam here um, from Tony. He says, when you first took over the captaincy of Kent, was there anyone in particular uh, that you modelled your captaincy style on? Doesn't have to be a previous Kent player. Anyone in particular in the captaincy stakes that you watched closely before you took on the armband yourself? Uh, in terms of someone who I, I definitely looked up to, I had obviously the pleasure of playing um, under Owen Morgan, which has been a, a, one of the best captains I've, I've played under. Certainly taking elements of what he does and how he goes about his business. Um, when I took over the captaincy, all the advice that I'd, I'd got from, from everyone really was just be yourself. Don't try and necessarily model on um, someone in particular. Take elements of different captains um, to take on board. But yeah, just be yourself and um, just try and get the team going in one direction, um, getting, getting people moving in one direction as, as a team. I think all successful teams that are successful over a consistent period of time, that's one thing they do really well. Um, they gel and uh, focus all their energy into a common goal. So, yeah, in terms, of, in terms of that, initially, it was very much going with an open mind. Uh, don't, don't kind of have a closed eyes on anything, just try and soak it all up and, um, and go with it. It has always been my ambition and uh, my view is to make Kent the best county in the country. And I think that's what's great with the group of players we've got, Paul as well as director of cricket, the whole staff are all moving in that direction and that's our common goal. Um, it's easy to kind of say and say to the group, but actually to get a group of people to buy into that and, and really believe in that is really special. And I think everyone can see now that our squad is as exciting as it's ever been at Kent. Certainly since I've been involved, since I've been in the academy or even the age groups, um, we had that kind of golden era when we obviously won the T20 and a fantastic squad. But you look at it now in terms of homegrown talent as well mixed in there. Uh, it's, it's really exciting times for the club and it, it's certainly moving in the right direction. Um, going back to the captaincy just quickly someone uh, which has been phenomenal for me in the last couple of years and, and it's a huge benefit of these overseas tournaments I know people 
uh, criticise and have done in the past, criticise me and other players for going abroad and experiencing different environments. But being around MS Dhoni was uh, just surreal in many ways and his captaincy under the amount of scrutiny and pressure that he's under it's impossible not to learn from from a guy like that and to be on top of the world stage for so long and be so successful uh, you see why when you're in really close quarters with him and how how he stays so calm under pressure uh, both as a captain and, and as a player is something I I really took from him and and he said many occasions that it's a skill that needs to be worked on it doesn't happen overnight he was a Roger Federer as a kid he said uh, no I'm rambling but um, he, he said he used to have a terrible attitude a, a hot temper and uh, he had to learn these skills over time which I, I found really interesting and, and something that I've definitely taken on board and and spent a lot of time in this lockdown it's something that I'm working on uh, right now there's different things to look at he certainly does have some huge entourage around him, doesn't he, MS Stoney? I interviewed him once. I think there are about 20 people surrounding me, watching me like a hawk, listen to every single word that I asked him. So he does have huge amounts of stuff to deal I'm with. I'm working um, on the entourage. Are you? <laughs> We've, you've got one. Yeah, you've got exactly. one if we get some T20, and I'll be, I'll be the one. Um, not surprisingly, with no cricket going on at the moment, there's a huge number of questions which have been going down memory lane and anonymous has been sending in a lot of questions again uh, this week this one's for you paul again another cricket question from your own career to be loving this um <laughs> says not many people can say they were competing for a place against arguably the greatest ever glove man cricket has ever seen with sam billings accepted of course um what was it like watching and training with alan knott great question what a great question what a great man um, I spoke to him only two days ago, actually. It, 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 I don't know whether many people know, but he was over in the country in March. Um, and he lives in Cyprus now. And he and his wife are over here doing a few um, sort of evening talks and so on. And uh, uh, the flights um, having stopped, he's now been trapped as such in outside Maidstone. So his hotel closed and he's found a B&B &B or an Airbnb. Uh, for the next couple of weeks or so. So I've been talking with Nottingham, I haven't seen him for a little while, but he's in great form, doesn't quite know when he's going to get back to Cyprus. We've been looking at whether we can help him out on, uh, on some accommodation, and, and uh, in fact, Jonathan's been looking as well. So uh, he, he's in great form. As a, as a cricketer, he was my absolute hero. I mean, I, I was brought up in a wicket-keeping family. My father played a few games for Kent, so there was some wicket-keeping blood in there. But Notty was just... Uh, a genius uh, and you couldn't take your eyes off him really with his red gloves and uh, he was just brilliant and when I joined the staff he absolutely was uh, uh, was was in you know but he, he he couldn't have been nicer couldn't have been more helpful in terms of training or working <laughs> with um, I mean I don't know whether people will remember the Kerry Packer days when when, when Anna Knott took a sabbatical uh, I'd made my debut uh, the year before, 1977, played seven championship matches, ended up on an England tour because Notty went to take Gary Packer. And the following year, 1978, we had a championship winning side and Notty took a sabbatical uh, and worked in his sports shop with his brother in Herne Bay. And I kept that whole summer, uh, along with a very strong Kent side, all the other uh, Packer players were playing. And we ended up winning the championship in the Benson Hedges that year. Uh, and, and ever since, we've, we've kept in touch. Uh, I left because he was... Uh, he was still very much in possession and when apparently the Kerry Packer players were allowed back to play for England, um, in the Kent committee had a tricky task but had the world's best wicket keeper batsman. They obviously offered him a four-year contract. Whilst they offered me a four-year contract, it was time uh, to, for me to try and play some first-class cricket. So I ended up left and uh, went to Middlesex. But uh, he absolutely was my hero at the time. And he was, he was the first person that I was aware of who actually wrote a, wrote a training book for wicket keepers. Uh, it was in a little pamphlet type form. I probably still got it in the attic somewhere, but it, it, it was absolutely brilliant. And I can't speak highly enough of, uh, of the guy. It's quite tough, isn't it, being in lockdown just outside Maidstone. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, you, Jonathan, before we started this, you, you, were, you were talking about this, this bat that you've, you, I don't know if you've still got it with you there, this bat, which is 1973. Uh, not his name, I'm sure, is in it. You just want to read down this, this autograph bat that you've got. Just read out some of these fantastic names, some of the legends of the Kent cricket game. Well, as a boy, I spent my time at uh, Canterbury Cricket Week and as all, all holidays, if I could, 
trying to get on the pitch to get autographs. So here's this bat that I had forgotten that I'd got. This is Kent 1973. And I got all these autographs, obviously, at the end of end of one game. Mike Dennis, Brian Luckers, Colin Cowdery, Derek Underwood, Alan Knott, uh, Norman Graham, Assie Fickbell, Alan Elam, David Nichols, Bob Walmer, John Shepherd, Graham Johnson, and Richard Hills. That's not a bad day's work, I think, for an <laughs> autograph hunter. <laughs> that <laughs> that is a bad side either. Well, I was going to say, Paul, how many of those did you play with? Pretty much all? Yeah, I mean, I, I started in 77, so almost all of those, in fact, were around. Uh, Norman Graham had just finishing that year, but uh, no, they were a great side. And it had been a long time in the making. You know, Les Ames took over as manager in 1955, Colin Cowdery took over as captain, and they gradually built a side, uh, you know, competed very hard in the 60s, but won the championship in the 70s, and then had this wonderful decade of, I don't know what it was, 10 or 11 trophies, something extraordinary like that during that period. And I was lucky enough to see the end of it. Uh, there's a wonderful cricketers there. All-time great, actually. Now, one of the questions which has been sent in whilst we've been talking here, I think this is from Keith as well. It says, uh, your favourite moment in a Kent shirt or watching Kent? So, Sam, you've got to pick out a, a career highlight from your, what, eight, nine years in a Kent shirt now? Ooh, um... Uh, one springs to mind straight away, and even though it wasn't the result that we got, um, it was leading out the team for the Lords final. It really was kind of a childhood dream, actually. Um, not necessarily, I, I, I never envisaged necessarily captaining Kent, but playing in a Lords final, playing in a big occasion for Kent, um, that's always been a huge goal for me. And the next step for us is obviously to rectify that result. But that that was a that was an amazing um, day. I think the support really kind of resonates and and comes back to me now is that the support that Kent had on that day was phenomenal, and and throughout that whole year and and it's been ongoing. Um, it was just a sea of kind of blue around Lords. It was just a shame we couldn't get the result, like I said. But that definitely springs to mind, and also getting my first hundred for Kent at at, um, at Canterbury. Uh, Again, a childhood dream, um, watching all these players and like, um, like we both just said, I mean, running onto the pitch and getting my autograph book out. I was that kid who, uh, who, who queued up and I think I've got Min Patel in my autograph book. I saw about <laughs> five times. Poor Min, I've just hassled him. And now uh, he has to put up with me every single day. So, um, yeah, I, I think that ha those, those two moments spring to mind. That's not bad, Min Patel. What did you say five times? That's, that's a pretty good start. <laughs> got Chris Penn twice when I first went. Um, Paul, you've kind of answered this in a way, but uh, favourite moment in the Kent shirt? You've already mentioned a championship winning season. What else? Well, I, I remember playing at Folkestone uh, against Essex uh, in 1977. We were gunning for the championship and we got onto a wet wicket. And the, the challenge and just the sheer joy of keeping wicket to deadly, bowling on a wet wicket, where the bowler really had no chance. Sorry, the batter really had sort of felt as though he had no chance, that you couldn't score a run anywhere. And as a wicket keeper, you just stood and you reckon that four out of six balls were going to come through to you. Uh, and just to see the master at work and to keep wicket to him uh, was, uh, it was just one of those things you'll never forget, really. So I felt I was very lucky that we still played, or I still played at the time when we played on some uncovered wickets. Uh, and probably the best bowler there's ever been on, on, on uncovered wickets, I was able to, to keep wicket to that one. So I'll always remember that. I think we won the game, you know, with about... I don't know, 10, 10 minutes to go. We, we didn't have overs, I don't think, at that time. 10 minutes to go, seven down, chasing a low score. Uh, we went on to win or share the championship that year. But it was, a, it was just a you know, really exciting time. It was on my first year, one of my first four or five games, uh, and uh, playing in front of a big crowd and keeping to, to Derek on a wet wicket was, um, yeah, memorable. And Jonathan, if I was going to ask you of your favourite moment in a Kent shirt, it obviously be tonight. Right now, um, but as a Kent fan, apart from getting that autograph bat of all those legendary names, could you pick out one moment as a, a Kent cricket fan which really sticks in your mind? Yeah, I can actually. I can remember one remarkable uh, uh, occasion. Most people remember bowling feats or batting feats, but I can remember um, 
when T20 was in its infancy, uh, Matthew Fleming getting five run outs, I think in four overs, and I think four of them were direct hits. We had a huge marquee at Canterbury and maybe sort of two or 300 customers and sort of three of them were right in front of us and it completely changed the game. It was a truly remarkable piece of uh, single-handed uh, achievement. So that, that really stands out. But I have been in a Kent shirt before. I'm going to correct you, uh, uh, Steve. We had um, uh, a, a game against Old England at Canterbury. It's the only time I've played on the St. Lawrence ground. It was a charity game for the 60th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. And uh, we got sort of old, old Kent and uh, against Old England and one or two people like me were allowed to, to, to uh, play. And the highlight of my cricket career was, was facing Derek Underwood, actually connecting with uh, one of his balls, which came down this extraordinary trajectory on the left-hand side and being caught on the boundary by Richard Ellison. He's a big man, a tall man, who had to jump. So I very nearly hit him for six. The fact that I was out for naught was irrelevant. I was thrilled to actually <laughs> connect with the ball. Um, so uh, there we go. What would have happened if you'd faced Derek Underwood on an uncovered pitch and it had been raining nearly all day? Oh, well, it was, it was a surreal experience. Um, the, the angle of uh, his bowling left arm over was so remarkable. It was uh, a very memorable occasion. Another good question here from uh, Ed. This one's for you, Sam, uh, for the captain here. Where do your aspirations lie currently uh, with regard to playing international cricket? Is the England Test team something that you aspire to, or is it only limited overs? I'm sure you'd love to get in that Test team if it would ever happen, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Uh, the test, test cricket has always been a huge focus for any cricketer, I think, who's grown up in this country. The way... Uh, careers have kind of panned out in recent times, certainly because of T20 cricket, the opportunities that you can have. And uh, as, as everyone kind of can see the way my career, uh, I kind of burst onto the scene in terms of white ball cricket, came into the side. Uh, Garrett Jones used to keep wicket in terms of four-day cricket. So my opportunities were in the white ball game and then obviously moved on to England. And um, that was kind of the route that my career has taken. I think the biggest thing for me is the end of last year, obviously missing a lot of the season due to my shoulder. Um, it proved to me more than anything um, that I have actually got the game to be able to take the step up and be successful in the longer format of the game. I enjoyed uh, the end of that last season as a team um, and as an individual a huge amount um, after what was a pretty disappointing few months. So, in terms of four-day cricket, there's no kind of no other way to describe it, but they're the most fulfilling victories as a team when you grafted uh, together for four days, um, and to do that up at uh, up at Notts, at Trent Bridge, up at Yorkshire last year um, w was amazing. And so for me, again, it proved to me that I can be successful. Uh, as a batsman in, in that format of the game, which I hadn't necessarily done consistently in the past. So um, all my, the way I decided to kind of focus my energy this year, the beginning of this year was to play championship cricket. Uh, we had long discussions, uh, Paul and I and, and Matt Walker, and actually really to kind of give test cricket a really good go and hopefully start the season well. It's not happened, obviously, with everything going on. Um, but that is, is a huge focus for me moving forward. And just playing international cricket full stop uh, absolutely is, is a focus uh, moving forward and the T20 World Cup coming up. I know I might be biased as someone who just loves all forms of cricket. I love the T20. I like 50 over cricket. But if you're a proper cricket fan, you know, you talked about four-day cricket, a five-day test that goes right down to the wire. The tension that's involved, you just can't beat that, can you? You can't beat that, no. But... Everyone likes different things, Steve. You know that. I like it all. I like it all. Cater, for, cater for everyone. So um, I, I don't. I think it's got away, which is great. I think the um, the view around T Twenty and whether one format's uh, more important than others. I, I think that's actually moved on quite a bit, and it's really good because actually the younger generation really do enjoy T Twenty, and that's not wrong. It, it used to be frowned upon. Actually, yeah. we just need to get people involved in cricket, both as supporters and playing the game 
and that's the most important thing. Society changes and, and cricket reflect, reflects that. Um, it's certainly in this country, there will always be that tradition um, and, and test cricket will uphold that. So um, certainly my generation, we still want to play test cricket, I assure you that. Well, now here comes the question which I think has been judged by the panel as the star question of the evening, who wins a prize courtesy of Shepard Neem and specifically of Spitfire. Do you know what the prize is, Jonathan, for this star question? Sounds like it's going to be a case of the 151st anniversary, judging <laughs> by your earlier question. Fantastic <laughs> lock, yeah, that lockdown, lockdown hamper. Lockdown, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. the, the person who sent this question is not getting it to the next table at the earliest, then, are they? The person who sent this question in is Fergus. I think it's Fergus Mackay or Mackie, maybe. Um, is this, your, this is a really hard one. I hope you've been thinking about this. What is your all time Kent 11 made up of capped? England players. Paul Downton, director of cricket, Ashes winning wicketkeeper. I'm going to start with you on this one, please. I don't know how many players you're going to chip in each, or whether you're going to do a full 11, but anyway, take it away, Paul. It's your all time Kent 11 made up of capped England players. We, we, we decided that we should go for a one day side um, to celebrate the Spitfire association with Kent. So, um, but it could obviously go back in time. Um, Really difficult uh, because I was lucky enough to play in that 70s as we've already talked about. So it'd be hard to leave out some of those players. You know, Luckhurst was a brilliant one-day cricketer. Um, Woolmer was a brilliant one-day cricketer. We've already talked about Notty. And of course, Deadly, it would be impossible to leave him out. Um, but I, I think we ought to, I ought to sort of hand it over um, to, uh, uh, to maybe Jonathan, actually, to contribute maybe two or three more. And then Sam, I think, will come in with some modern-day heroes. Go on then, Jonathan. Oh, You've got all those names on your back for a start. It would be hard to Yes, well, I think, um, I, mean, I was going to mention Bob Woolmer. I'm glad you did. I think I would add Alan Elam. I think he got a cap, or uh, two caps, but um, I, I hope I'm We can correct. give him one. We can give him we one. Give, <laughs> um, he, he was the most <laughs> incredible um, outfielder. Um, and uh, I think Matthew Fleming is also someone that would be, be in there as a one-day cricketer, incredible pinch hitter and good sort of bowler at, uh, bowler at the death. Um, I've always admired James Treadwell uh, as a sort of, you know, f flat, tight, tight bowler in, those, in the right conditions. I thought he did extremely well uh, for, for a while. So um, uh, that, that would be my contribution. Go on in, Sam. You've got to throw in some of the more modern names here. <laughs> well, I've got to look after my mates sometimes. So, of course. Uh, of course. Uh, I, I think Joe Denley, over the, certainly over the last three, four years, has shown his true value as an all-rounder. Um, his leg spin bowling in one-day cricket has been very successful. He's a devastating top-order batsman and a very good fielder. And so adds a huge amount of value um, and a great guy to be around the change room. So Joe's in there for me. Uh, I'm going to have to go for his mate as well, Rob Key. He was a great, um, great captain, great captain to play under, tactically incredible. And um, yeah, I learned a hell of a lot from, from Rob. So uh, those two guys, I completely agree uh, with Jonathan about James Treadwell. Underrated in many respects, I think, uh, in terms of economy and just very smart, always knew one step ahead of the bats from what they're going to do or try. Um, yeah, Treddy was, was fantastic, certainly in one-day cricket. So uh, I'm sorry to overlap, but those are the three I'll, I'll go for. Okay, good. We've got a nice spread of names and a nice... I shouldn't do that on this, should I? A nice spread of eras as well. Uh, we're just about time up here. So thank you very much to all of you who sent your questions in advance. And apologies if we didn't get around to yours. Thank you very much to everyone who sent in questions while we've been chatting away. This 45 minutes has flown by. Jonathan, we're going to come to you to wrap up here because you mentioned right at the start, uh, you've got your online service going on. Oh, I've been one of the very few people during this lockdown who's cut right down on the alcohol. And now I think it's time for me to unlock my alcohol cupboard and get online uh, to Shepherd Neve. So tell us about your online shop. And I believe um, there's donations there going to Kent's NHS community. That's right. So every, every case that you buy, uh, we make a donation to the 
to the Kent uh, NHS. Um, we've only reopened it last week. Uh, we've had a lot of orders so far. Um, that's cases of wine uh, or beer, free delivery. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to have to be as creative as we can to keep our business going during this lockdown. So if you can support it, it's going to a great cause. And also you're supporting Shepherd Neem. So much appreciated if you can. Thank you. And just tell me how I find it online. Do I just whack Shepherd Neem into my Google? It's right on the face of, uh, of, uh, of our website. That's a good place to start. Uh, and if you go on all of our social media channels, you can find links there too. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm going to do that as soon as I've logged off this Zoom call. Jonathan Neem, Chief Exec of Shepherd Neem. Thank you for your continued support, being one of our partners during this difficult time. Let's hope it's not too long until we can get into a pub and have a, a pint of Spitfire. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. A pleasure. Paul Downton, Kent's Director of Cricket. Thank you very much for that uh, insight. Oh, there was just one last thing, wasn't there, about grants, um, which we wanted to mention very quickly oh, for, uh, for clubs. Yeah. Well, there were a couple of things, actually. Just just briefly, uh, I know there was a question that came in about, uh, from, from a club cricket perspective uh, and club's perspective, about how one could uh, apply to the ECB grants and those kind of things. Uh, rather go into any detail here, because every club, I think, will be different. There will be some constraining factors. Uh, but Andy Griffiths, our Director of Community Cricket, uh, and James Moss uh, will be very able to, uh, to answer any questions that might be out there about how you apply for the loans or the grants from the ECB. Uh, and I know they're in continual contact with them. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, uh, you'll hear shortly about uh, something we're going to try and get behind, which is the Rainbow Run, uh, which will be raising some money for... Uh, uh, some of the hospitals in Kent uh, over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks on the 17th of May. Uh, but uh, just uh, uh, um, keep your eyes out for that uh, in terms of uh, our communications from, uh, uh, from, from the website, etc. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much. We'll see you again soon. And Sam Billings, Kent's captain. Any final words, Sam? Any bits of wisdom for us in this time of lockdown? No wisdom at all, Steve. Um, oh. <laughs> no, I think I think it's just keep on looking after each other, and uh, as as we are trying to do your your kind of support as fans, uh, we see all the social media stuff that you always uh, ask questions, and we're kind of trying hard to interact as much as we can um, to answer all those questions. But uh, your support means a lot, and uh, like I said earlier, the support over the last few years has been has been incredible. And I don't see that stopping. So um, thanks a lot. And thanks for everyone to tune in. Thank you very much. Sam Billings, Kent Captain, Director of Cricket, Paul Downton, Chief Executive of Shepherd Neem, Jonathan Neem. Thank you to all of you for tuning in to this latest Spitfire session. With our thanks again to Spitfire. One under Fergus, who's won the crate of beer. That is the prize courtesy of Shepherd Neem for sending in the star question. There'll be another one of these Spitfire sessions next week. So keep your eyes online and Kent's social media channels for more details we'll do another one next monday look forward to seeing you all then in the meantime stay safe i'll continue thanks to everyone on the front line all the key essential workers we'll see you again next week for another spitfire session thanks.